attended the previous hearing. It started at 3. It ran 2 hours and 45 minutes. Um, but I appreciate everyone's patience. I'm sure you don't want to hear me talk. You kind of want to hear what's going on and give everyone a chance to, to uh, sign up who's willing to, that wants to speak on behalf of, of whatever their organization or group is. Speaker slips are over here. You can drop them off with John Oswald, who's standing here, or grab a speaker slip from him directly if he has them. Um, and we're going to go with uh, Rec and Parks. We're going to move to development. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get public testimony on this. But uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Zach Klein. I'm the chair of the Development and Recreation and Parks Committee. Uh, and I welcome everyone tonight. And again, uh, thank them for their patience. Director McKnight, the floor is yours. Chairman Klein, thank you uh, for this opportunity this evening to talk about the uh, Recreation and Parks uh, 2014 budget. Uh, as we begin to talk about 14, I want to just kind of summarize some things from 2013. 2013 was a real successful year for our department. We saw a continuation as well as growth of many of our programs and activities that the department offers. Uh, we've continued to program the Scioto Mile and Bicentennial Park, and those programs have continued to grow. The Jazz and Ribs Fest was another successful uh, event this year. We did add staff this year in partnership with Public Safety to address the permit process for runs and races. Uh, as the downtown has developed, we've seen a lot more runs and races and wanted to uh, revise that permit process, and that's worked pretty well this year. Uh, our camps and summer camp programs for two, uh, uh, 2013 were very successful. Just a couple of numbers, we registered over 11,875 people this year for our summer camps and uh, playground programs. 2,000 went to the zoo, 1,600 went to Zumbezi Bay. Those, the 1,600 went to Zumbezi Bay was on one day, so that was a, a big event for us. 900 went to a Clippers game. We had 2,345 participants who took swim lessons, uh, and we had over 120,000 clicks through our turnstiles at the swimming pools this year. We added the city leaders program to our capital kids activities, provided financial support to some of the youth sports organizations that utilize our fields. We are also a pilot site this year and want to continue in 2014 with the new Jack, Lick Jack Nicholas Learning Leagues, which teach golf to kids age five to eight. And we did that at a couple of our recreation centers and also at one of our golf courses. We continue to offer the APPS program, that's the application for purpose, pride, and success, and added eight additional Cap City nights this year. We opened up the renovated Milo Grogan Community Center and two new spray grounds, one at Indian Mound and the other at Blackburn Community Centers. We also ex <clears throat> excuse me, expanded our late night basketball program, and we've added a fitness coordinator to better manage the fitness rooms, and we're going to be doing some more with the fitness programs in 2014. As we begin 2014, just to summarize the budget, We'll continue to provide basically the same current level of service, but we do have some additions that I'll talk about in a moment. The 2014 budget is $41,547,134. That includes about $4.3 million in earned income and $834,022 in CDBG dollars. Uh, the department's authorized strength will go from about 275 in 2013 to 298 in 2014, which is an increase in 23 full-time positions. Uh, the CDBG funds primarily fund the Capital Kids Program, the Schools Out Program, some part-time hours in our centers, and the Ready, Set, Learn Program, which is administered through the United Way of Central Ohio. Now, just to highlight some of our 2014 uh, budget items, we'll continue to operate the 29 community centers, but this year we're excited uh, uh, we're going to open six of those centers that were part-time, full-time. Those centers are Milo Grogan, Douglas, Sullivan Gardens, Holton, Tuttle, and the Adams Center. In opening those centers, we'll be add adding a total of 12 full-time staff to our department, and it'll make it possible to expand programming at those sites, adding some adult programming, preschool programming, and more uh, activities for children. Generally, the hours of these centers when we reopen them will be noon to 9 p.m. Tuesday through Friday and 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturdays. And that's during the school year. In the summer, we're more of an 8 to 5 Monday through Friday hours. But the hours during those school years may vary some center to center as well uh, to address the specific needs within that community. We may open some of them up earlier if there's some adult programming or preschool programming, that type of thing. So. Generally, those are the hours, but uh, they'll be 40 hours a week, and we'll, we'll, we'll flex those where we need to to better serve the community. We'll continue to operate the seven outdoor pools, the indoor swim center, and three spray grounds, and we're going to be adding an aquatic supervisor this year also to help uh, manage some of these expanded uh, aquatic facilities and programs. 
Uh, due to increased demand uh, and waiting lists, we're going to add camp opportunities to two of our programs. The outdoor education programs and our therapeutic recreation programs have waiting lists every year. So we're going to be adding classes or adding camps to those programs to try to address some of that uh, need. And we're also going to be adding classes at our cultural arts center as the Scioto Mile and Bicentennial Park have uh, wrapped up and some of the development downtown's uh, been completed and increased residential development. We're seeing a growth in the cultural arts center and the number of folks that visit that and want to take those classes. We're also going to be adding staff in our maintenance operation uh, in an effort to continue to restore some of the redu reductions that we had in 2009. We'll be adding some staff to our downtown park maintenance zone. One of those is an irrigation specialist. As we've developed these parks downtown, we're going to be uh, uh, we're, we're irrigating them, and we really need somebody with a little more expertise there. Um, one of the things we're taking on this year will be the spring and long caps. Uh, as part of the 7071 project, which has some fairly extensive landscaping on those. We're also starting to gear up in 2015, as you're aware, we'll pick up the Scioto Greenway project, which will add almost 33 acres of parkland downtown. We're also going to be adding three staff to restore one of our park maintenance zones that we lost in 2014. This will allow us to begin catching up and improving the level of maintenance in all of our neighborhood and community parks. We continue to offer leagues and tournaments throughout our, through our sports office. Uh, this year we just got notice uh, about two months ago that we're going to be hosting the National Softball Association Super World Series Tournament. Uh, that comes in, I think it's October of 2014. They'll bring in over 200 adult teams from all over the country. Uh, this tournament is in addition to all the other tournaments that Burliner Park hosts every weekend throughout the summer. And based on uh, some numbers that we've gotten from the Columbus Sports Commis Commission, we estimate the uh, visitor spending in 2013 with those tournaments is about $15 million, so it's a significant impact. And finally, we'll continue to provide support to many of the organizations that we partner with, like the Franklin Park Conservatory, COWIC, COSI, and the Martin Luther King Center. And in fact, the King Center will be receiving an additional $125,000 over 2013 in the 2014 budget. There are a couple of items that uh, are not included in the 2014 budget that I want to mention. One, in 2013, Council uh, generously provided $250,000 to help grow the summer food program. We had some good success with that uh, uh, in 2013. We increased the number of sites that we operate by 38, and we increased the participation by almost 11 percent. Uh, still a long way to go in terms of the number of people we serve, but uh, we want to continue to grow that. In fact, in 2013, during the summer program, we've provided 482,739 meals and snacks during that 10-week period. So that's a pretty significant number. Uh, we're hoping those funds will continue to be available so we can continue to grow that program and market it. The other, and, and this usually isn't part of the uh, general fund operating budget, but in 2013 we received $192,000 uh, through City Council from the bed tax to support the partnership through sponsorship program and some of our events such as Festival Latino and Jazz and Rib Fest. That's usually a separate budgeting cycle uh, and we'll be uh, interested in talking with you about that as we get closer to that process, uh, but it's imperative to support those programs. We're, we're, the other thing we're doing this year, we kicked off in 2013, we're excited about is the development of a master plan for the department. And we brought in some consultants from out of town and we'll take a hard look at our department, all the programs we offer and all the facilities we have and help us in terms of the direction that the department should be going over the next five to 10 years. And we'll be sitting down with you more talking about that in the coming months. But I think it'll be a great tool as we look to the future, future budgets and uh, future decisions uh, about what our facility needs are, what types of programs, uh, and are we spending the dollars in the right area or should we be looking at some adjustments and changes. But in summary, we're looking forward to the upcoming year and continuing the many programs and services we offer the community, including the proposed expansions that I outlined here today. We believe that they will have positive impacts on our city and its citizens. The Recreation and Parks Department's mission is to enrich the lives of our citizens. Our staff remains committed to that mission as we look to the future. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Director uh, McKnight. Uh, the most encouraging uh, 
thing that I heard was the restoration of the services and rec centers. You know, that was a promise to the voters in 2009, uh, along with the, t the tax increase vote uh, prior to my time on council, but it was the fact that um, if the voters uh, believed in raising the taxes, their income taxes, that there would be an opportunity to restore services. Um, and it sounds like we're headed in that right, that direction. We did. We closed 12 centers and we've, we've had them all open, but not full service yet. And this gets us most of the way back. The, uh, there's one facility that is still not operated by us, and that's the Columbus Performing Arts Center. That's the theater uh, facility out on Franklin Avenue uh, in the Old Town East, and we're still operating that in partnership with CATCO and the Phoenix Theater. Okay. Thank you, Director McKnight. Is that all that Reckon Parks has this evening? That's all I have at this point. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Director Brandon development. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Klein. I thank you for the opportunity to present the Department of Development's 2014 budget. The Development Department's general fund proposed budget for 2014 is $23,737,712, and this supports 130 full-time employees. The 2014 general fund staffing levels will increase by 12 full-time positions. Nine positions will be added to the code enforcement staff. One real estate asset manager will be added to our land redevelopment office. One position will be added to manage the department's capital improvement budget. And one planner one position is added to our planning division. The additional code enforcement positions will constitute a new team that will be proactive in addressing and targeting areas experiencing the greatest challenge and dealing with uh, repeat offenders as we discussed for about three hours. <laughs> Total support for the social service agencies will total over $4.9 million, comprised of $3,216,517 in general fund support and nearly $1.7 million in emergency human service funding. Support for the Community Shelter Board and the Rebuilding Lives Program will provide level funding of over $4.2 million in 2014, with the majority of the funding coming from the general fund. The Development Department offers numerous financial tools to assist the needs of a growing business. Financial incentives are used strategically to leverage significant business expansions or relocations. Incentives are based on the benefits of a project that it represents for the community and whether tax incentives are necessary to secure the project for Columbus. Criteria include the amount of investment and job creation and or retention and whether the project involves a priority sector or targeted geographic area. The 2014 budget includes $12.7 million for incentives that are used to aggressively pursue job creation and investment. These dollars are budgeted in the Finance Department's citywide account. Support for the Capital Crossroads Special Improvement District is also included at $190,000 for 2014. The Columbus and Franklin County Finance Authority will receive $150,000 in general fund support from the city, and this is the same level of support provided over the past several years. Economic development will receive over $1.2 million to assist in the economic development efforts put forth by Columbus 2020 and Tech Columbus. The 2014 budget includes $325,000 to continue our efforts on the retention and expansion of existing Columbus businesses, the attraction of new businesses to Columbus, and the creation of new business opportunities from local research institutions and community entrepreneurs. Also included in this budget is $200,000 for a Near East partnership agreement to support OSU with the development efforts on the Near East side. A budget of over $7.6 million is recommended in the general fund for the Code Enforcement Division in 2014 and will support a staff of 73 individuals, five of which are assigned to the second shift. CDBG funds support a staff of nine, bringing total division staff to 82. So far this year, the Code Enforcement staff has received 27,493 service requests from 311, and from those, they have issued 17,479 notices of violations. Funding of $250,000 is provided from the general fund for the demolition of unsafe structures. $685,000 is included for weed abatement services under the Environmental Nuisance Program. Included in the 2014 general fund budget is $150,000 to maintain land bank properties. 
The mission of the Department of Development is to engage and promote strong, healthy, distinct, and vibrant neighborhoods, provide an atmosphere that promotes job creation and economic growth in existing and emerging industries, develop a thriving downtown that is recognized as a regional asset, and provide high-quality customer service. We, we believe that the 2014 budget will allow us to do that, and I thank you and welcome any questions at this time. Thank you, uh, Deputy Director Brandon. Uh, what I'd like to do, instead of uh, monopolizing the time, is go ahead and go directly to speaker slips to let the, the community give their input on uh, the budget process. Uh, again, speaker slips, if you have them or want to speak, give them to John, who's sitting over here. Raise your hand, John. Okay, maybe a little higher next time. Um, uh, and we'll go in the order that they're received. Uh, the first speaker is Kevin Tyler, Create Columbus Commission. Mr. Tyler. If you could approach the podium, uh, identify any organizations you represent, your address, and you'll have three minutes, sir. Thanks uh, for coming down to council. Council Member Klein, I'm Kevin Tyler, uh, chair of the Creek Columbus Commission and Columbus resident. Uh, I uh, am here representing the commission. Uh, the commission was established in 2007 and is a board of young professionals who were appointed and, and is funded by the mayor and city council president to serve as the community's foremost thought leader uh, on young professional interests, experiences, and priorities. Through strategic community building efforts and a targeted YP grants program, the Create Columbus Commission strives to make Columbus the nation's number one destination for young professionals. In the summer of 2013, the Create Columbus Commission introduced the Create Columbus Grants Program to support initiatives by and for young professionals that make Columbus the best place to live, work, and raise a family. The goals of the Create Columbus Grants Program are threefold. One, to encourage and support residents to launch innovative, community-based initiatives with a specific young professionals component. Two, to provide financial support I'm sorry, to provide strategic financial support for one-time costs for events, initiatives, and programs that impact young professionals directly. And three, to improve the young professional experience in the following areas, arts, sports and entertainment, careers, neighborhoods, and transportation. The commission received about 40 grant applications, totaling just under $330,000, and we were able to fund eight of the applications for a total of $60,460 leaving a difference of about $270,000. The organizations that we funded were BESA, Community Research Partners, the Mount Vernon Special Improvement District, Transit Columbus, the Short North Alliance, Capital Crossroads, Columbus Soup, and the Founders Factory. The Create Columbus Commission is excited to continue supporting young professionals doing incredible things for our community. And we are asking Council and the Development Committee to consider increasing our impact to $150,000 for the upcoming grant cycle. Thank you for your consideration of this request, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tyler. appreciate you coming down to Council. The next speaker is Ed Lentz, the Columbus Landmarks Foundation. Mr. Lenz, thank you for coming down this evening. If you could reintroduce yourself, identify any organizations you represent, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Okay. I'm Ed Lentz with the Columbus Landmarks Foundation. We're at 61 Jefferson Avenue. Founded in 1977, Columbus Landmarks has worked with the City of Columbus for 36 years to preserve the best of the past in Columbus while promoting sound new design for our city. Over the years, we've worked in public-private partnership with the City of Columbus to achieve those goals, and we've assisted in the placement of a number of sites and districts on the National Register of Historic Places. We were directly involved in the creation of the Historic Resources Commission and have worked to list a number of sites and districts with that commission as well. We've not only been involved with saving the best of the past, Columbus Landmarks has worked with both the public and private sectors on projects as varied as the construction of new buildings, the design of new bridges, the development of new parks. Today we serve on the Community Advisory Panel working with the Department of Public Utilities Blueprint Columbus Program to develop innovative plans to address stormwater and sewer overflow problems. In addition, we continue to offer an extensive series of tours, lectures, programs about the architecture and history of our city. We seek to preserve the best of the built environment. That's who we are and that's what we do. Shakespeare once said that the people are the city and the reflection of the people is in the streets and the structures that they have left for us. If we wish to know who we've been, all we have to do is notice what we have built. 
Every structure has a story, and all we have to do is learn not just to look, but to see what is there. Columbus has done a good job in preserving much of the best of its past. Much of the credit for that success must go to the efforts of the city of Columbus and the efforts of our public servants, both elected and professional, in making that happen. But much remains to be done. This city, like every major city in America, faces major problems with vacant and abandoned housing, homeowners in need of services, and residents in need of housing financial assistance. Columbus Landmarks, as we have in the past, stands ready to offer our assistance to the city of Columbus as we continue to work in these areas. Thank you for all you've done in the past and for the progress I'm confident we will continue to see in the future. Thank you tonight. Thank you, Mr. Lentz. Uh, our next speaker is Daniel Nam. Sir, if you could identify any organizations you represent, uh, your address, and uh, restate your name for the record. You all have three minutes. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Danny Nam. I represent uh, the Healthy Aging Youth Program, which is an after-school program for low-income youth in the west side of Columbus. So as you guys know, um, it's a high at-risk area. And what I wanted to do today was to talk about the target population, uh, discuss the program a little bit, and then show my gratitude to the Columbus Recreation Parks Department for supporting us uh, all these times. Uh, so the first thing is, you know, um, despite the model, model minority myth, a lot of Asian Americans are struggling in both in the school and at the, at the home. So a lot of these, you know, you can't group us all into one Asian American category because while some of the Japanese and Korean groups might be uh, thriving in Up Arlington, Dublin, you also have other groups like the Cambodian Americans in the hilltop that are, uh, have lower educational attainment rates than other minority groups, including African American, Latino, all of the groups. Uh, they also have uh, you know, thriving gangs on the west side, a lot of juvenile delinquency, and dropout rates like no other group. So to address this, we provide a number of uh, services, one being academic enrichment courses. We also created a student organization at OSU to recruit volunteers. So every single day, we have college students who come in and uh, work one-on-one -on -one with the kids. So we're at this, while we're, uh, you know, helping them with homework and things like that. We're also creating new norms for the neighborhood. Uh, of course, we make it fun. We have a b-boy crew. We also um, play sports. We do all kinds of art activities and we take the kids on field trips. Every year, as a result of uh, a lot of support from the community, including the Columbus Recreation and Parks Department, we've been able to have 70% of our youth raise their grades, uh, not their grades, raise their um, pre and post test scores by 25% in both reading and mathematics. We measure um, program effectiveness through evidence-based, proven uh, benchmark and progress monitoring assessments. Uh, on top of that, you know, all the intangibles as well. We know all the families. We just got 100 kids gifts. I love you guys, kids. And uh, yep, that's it. And the last thing I wanted to do, like I said, was I wanted to thank every, each and every one of you guys for you know, supporting my program. And I got to do this for the kids because I said I would. I love you guys. I love you, AJ. Thank you. Our next speaker is Heather Stevens. Welcome to Council, Ms. Stevens. If you just could restate your name for the record, your address, any organizations you represent, you have three minutes. Thanks, Councilman Klein. My name is Heather Stevens. Um, my address is 906 North Cassidy, Columbus, Ohio. Um, I'm not here to I don't represent any organizations. I'm here to speak for the Columbus and Parks. Um, more so about their, their hockey program. Um, my son has done a lot of programs through um, the Columbus and Parks and Recreations. Uh, none has been effective as the ice hockey um, program that they do sponsor and that they do assist with. My son has ADHD and he has a lot of behavioral issues. Um, we've really struggled uh, with him. Uh, he used to receive like a .5 grade point average. Um, now that he's doing hockey, he has more responsibilities. Um, the coach is just fabulous. Uh, not only does he teach him hockey, he teaches him life skills. Uh, my son is now receiving a 3.5 grade point average uh, just due to the fact that um, he just loves hockey so much and he knows that he has to keep his grades up. Uh, it's been a great program for him. Uh, without the Columbus Parks and Recreations, I would never be able to provide the opportunity for him. Hockey is such an expensive sport and it's just been so fantastic for him to be able to do that. Um, 
I believe that um, the Columbus Parks and Recreation, by providing these programs, um, they, pro they build self-esteem. Uh, that's what our children need today, is to have their self-esteem raised. Uh, if they have the low self-esteem, that's when they're, they're not going out and looking for jobs and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And they're being taught responsibilities in their sports programs and their you know, programs that they teach them. But it's more of a mentoring um, program for them. But it gives my son something to work so hard for. He's willing to work so hard to improve. Um, it's not only just changed him in his behavior, it's changed his eating habits, it's changed his other, um, you know, he wants to be more competitive. He wants to reach out and be more friendly and be more social. And it brings our family together to be able to go and watch him do what he loves most. So not only does it affect the kids, it affects the whole family as a whole. And a lot of times we're not spending the time with our children that we should. And if we have the opportunity to go watch them in the you know programs that they're doing, such as the hockey, uh, it brings the family together. Um, it provides the organized structure and it's a supervised environment. A lot of kids, if they're not involved in the parks and recreations in the neighborhoods, they don't have a supervised environment and that's what's causing a lot of the, the chaos today and I think that that's a good thing. Um, but it's got to a point that my son eats, sleeps, breathes, and lives hockey and without it, I don't think that I would be where I am with him now. I mean, his medication has dropped and everything and so, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to speak for a few minutes, but the Columbus Parks and Recreations definitely has um, definitely played a huge impact in our life. And thank you. Thank you for coming down, Ms. Stevens. Dr. McKnight, can you maybe talk to me about the hockey program, what that looks like from a budgetary standpoint? Uh, Councilman Klein, I don't have those specific budget figures for that program. We, we partner with the Columbus Hi Ice Hockey Club, and I think there's somebody else here that will speak tonight and can talk a little more about the program. We have one staff person that spends, um, uh, he's supposed to be spending a portion of his time on the hockey program. He probably spends a large percentage of his time on the hockey program. And uh, we work with them, and uh, I think there's about 3,900 kids in the program this year. And as, as uh, Ms. Stevens commented, I think there's an awful lot in the program that um, is beyond hockey. There's a lot of uh, education, life skills kinds of components that go along with that uh, to to provide more of a well-rounded program. So it is something that's growing. Tuttle Recreation Center and Adams, the, the Crumb Recreation Center are the primary sites that we operate out of, although we have uh, children that participate from a variety of sites. And we do, uh, during the summer, we'll do street hockey or roller hockey type programs as well. Is that funded in 2014? It is funded, yes, at this point. Okay, and are, is the Blue Jackets Foundation involved with that as well? We do get support from the Blue Jackets Foundation for the program as well. Okay, thank you, Director. Uh, the next speaker is Arlene Phillips. Ms. Phillips, are you here? Come on up, Ms. Phillips. Welcome to Council. You have three minutes. If you just could restate your name, identify yourself, any organizations you represent. My name is Arlene Phillips, and I'm, a citizen. Just, I'm sorry to speak a little louder into the microphone so I could hear you. Thanks. My name is Arlene Phillips, and I'm a citizen of Columbus. I live at 1792 Brynwood Court, um, and I'm here just to speak on behalf of Columbus Parks and Recs, uh, in particular the hockey program. Um, our family has been involved for a number of years, and um, I just really want to say that it's an excellent program. I mean, I see from uh, just from the onset how, you know, every part of it is essential into the growing up, this next generation of kids. Um, it's providing them with uh, leadership skills. Um, it's providing them um, uh, just different responsibilities. Um, <laughs> we need our young people to be an asset to society, and this program is helping them. Um, John works with these kids. He's a mentor to these children. And he's grown up, a lot of them, in the program to be mentors to their peers. And they're doing an excellent, excellent job. Um, to see him uh, train these kids up to skate, to play, to be a part of club teams, and then go on to work with the kids in the center, you know, little ones up under them from all ages, you know, from the, uh, the little bitty mites to the teenagers, you know, the young, the young uh, people, and they're doing a marvelous job. Um, my, my son, his, my middle son, um, it's, it's helped him to uh, 
obtained high life goals. He's expanded himself and he's taken on other unique challenges. Um, it's encouraged him to try it out to become, uh, I mean, apply for college, which, you know, it's, it's been hard for black males to, to go to school, but he's aspired to do that. And he's done that and he's doing an excellent job. And um, I say with everything that John has done with him, he's like that other part that has uh, shaped and molded him to be who he is, you know. And he does that with all the kids. Everybody that um, he works with, He's molding them and shaping them to, to affect our society for good. And that's just, it's needed. I mean, it's so needed. So I, I encourage you to uh, let the hockey program continue. And um, I just, uh, we love it. That's all I can say. You know, I love the excitement, the enthusiasm that comes from it. The kids, um, mm. I don't know how to express anything else that I want to say, but it's a good program. It's excellent. It needs to continue. It's, our children need it. Thank you for allowing me to express what I could. No, you're welcome. This is the forum. Do it. And I certainly uh, was able to translate your enthusiasm and excitement into what you uh, believe the value of the hockey program is. Thank you for coming down, uh, Ms. Phillips. Mike Watson. How you doing? <laughs> Welcome to council. Just state your name, uh, any organizations you represent, and your address. You have three minutes. All right. Hello, Councilman Klein. I'm Mike Watson. Um, I live at 320 Quarterway, Delaware, Ohio. I work at Nationwide, so on One Nationwide Boulevard. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of the City of Columbus Recreation and Parks Department, in particular, also the Columbus Ice Hockey Club. I'm actually the president. Um, I can't say enough about this program. I came on board as president seven years ago when um, I thought it was sorely needed. Um, we had a lot of kids that were not only passionate about hockey, but just passionate in general about life. And when you get kids that are so excited and so passionate about life, you really want to do your job as a citizen of the city of Columbus. You want to do your job to make sure that these kids with dreams can realize those dreams. So over the past three years, we've seen exponential growth. We've grown from 2,900 to 3,900 kids. Um, we've also seen a 65% increase in our fundraising. You know, that's once again, people in the city are seeing the value. We're seeing our partnerships just absolutely explode across the board. Not only the Columbus Blue Jackets Foundation, the NHL, um, USA Hockey, but we're also seeing other programs who recognize that we are really building some excellent leaders, like after school all stars. You know, they have their enrichment programs, their tutoring programs, their health and fitness programs. And we want to do more with after school all stars because we feel together we can make a positive Im impact. I was just talking with the president, Asleen Hernandez, in the, in the back, Rodriguez, excuse me. And one of the things we were talking about is we think we can touch another 1,000 lives by, by really partnering together. We also partner with a program out of Boston called Peace First. And Peace First believes strongly in that our youth can be uh, problem solvers in their communities. They can be leaders in their communities. And we actually have a custom-made program that we purchased from Peace First that addresses what we do in our hockey program. And why that's so important is we now have our kids going back into the program once they graduate. They're participating as coaches, skills coaches. They're also refereeing, so they actually have jobs that they could do too as well. So we're very excited about those opportunities too. You know, and in the end, when I think about this program and all that we can do, you know, I just asked the council, uh, I can do so much more with so much more funding. Um, right now, I'm touching the lives of 4,000 youths through two recreation centers. I have a vision of touching over 10,000 lives if we can expand to other recreation centers too as well. And I think we can do that with the leadership we have in place, the support of Director McKnight, the support of Assistant Director All Miller. You've heard some of our wonderful families that have come here and spoken about the program. And I believe we have the partnerships out there and the reputation and the leadership from within you know, that we can really start to impact the lives of these kids. And I can't say enough how excited we are about the flourishing partnership that we have with the After School All-Stars program, because I really think that that's going to push both of these programs, you know, in the next coming years where people realize our collective value, too, as well, to the city. 
Thank you, Council McLean. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Do you have any idea how much funding additional you're you're requesting? You know, or Director McKnight, what that what that would look like to fulfill the requests that's being made. Uh, our staff had taken a look at that, and uh, we looked at. Um, as I mentioned, we've got a, a staff person that works part time on it. Is what we'd like to do is allocate a full time position to it, a little bit of funding towards ice time, uh, and some equipment. Uh, it's not a huge request, is what we're looking at, but we're looking at close to seventy five thousand uh, dollars to be able to help grow that program and really have the, the the key element would be having an individual who focuses their staff time full time on it to really work with. Uh, Mr. Watson and the high, uh, Columbus Ice Hockey Club to help grow that program. And, and Councilman Klein, if I could just jump in right there. With even just a part-time person that we've had, we've been able to build, when you look at our coaching staff, and hockey is all about certification. In the, rec in the recreational hockey community, we have the top certified coaches. When you look across the board, your certifications can go from levels one through five. We have the most coaches that are sitting at level three through five, which means you can coach all the way up through kids graduating through high school. And that's very important because we now stay with those kids and we make sure we track those kids. We make sure they stay on the right path. So we're very excited about that too as well. Thank you, Mr. Watson. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Courtney Rowland. Welcome to Council, Ms. Rowland. Just could uh, re-identify yourself, identify any organizations you represent, your address, and you have three minutes. Thanks. Sure. My name is Courtney Rowland. My address is 614 South Champion Avenue. And I'm here today with Community Foundations. I want to thank you for having us. Um, community Foundations, you might remember us from last year. We were here about the same time uh, to advocate for the late night basketball program. Uh, we're passionate about that program because it really hits that crucial age group of teenagers during a crucial time frame. Um, so from, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night until 11 o'clock when um, youth are really susceptible to violent crime and other sorts of um, crime. So we really wanna thank you first of all uh, for giving that program an additional $20,000 this past year and we just want you to know that those dollars really did make a difference. Uh, the program served over 2,000 youth this past summer and gave them a safe and fun place to be. Um, we were actually able to go into several recreation uh, centers and do some surveys with people afterwards to ask them if they had participated, um, if they had any sort of feedback, um, and really their responses were, yes, we participated, yes, it was great, we want more. Um, we found out from the surveys that people were already very involved in the recreation centers. They loved the program, um, but they really wanted to see it expand to other centers. A lot of youth have trouble um, getting to different centers that are outside of their neighborhood, either because of transportation or because of safety concerns. Um, people also said it would have been great if it was better advertised. Um, uh, they wanted more staff to be available. Um, and we also found out that several older adults really um, wanted to be a part of the program and were interested in mentoring younger youth. Um, and the other big feedback we got was that people said they'd like to see other late night activities other than basketball in the rec centers. Um, we had over 70 people say they love to do a cooking class. Um, 60 said they would like to have weight rooms open during the midnight basketball time. And others said things like Zumba, art classes, movies, or video games, all sorts of different things that um, people that might not uh, enjoy basketball could participate in during those late night hours. Uh, we share this with you today um, because we want you to know that this program was successful this past year, that people participated in it and they liked it. Um, but we also want to share this with you because we want you to see the need for this program to continue to grow and expand. Um, our vision is really that 
Um, a person could walk into the recreation center in the evenings and find something that they could connect with, something fun and positive that they could do. Um, we want these centers to be community anchors, um, places where people can develop their skills. And we believe that's really the vision of, of council and um, of Director McKnight as well. Um, so we just want to encourage you to continue to invest in this program, to grow it, um, and to really put that as a priority. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Rowland. Uh, Director McKnight, do you have any additional comments? I know that was a, a newer expansion last year that council brought forward. Um, uh, maybe talk a little bit about where that is in the 2014 proposed budget and just any general thoughts you have about the program. Um, I agree. It's a, it's a great program. I think a lot of what Courtney, um, Ms. Rowland talked about was the um, is a lot of what we do during the school year. Our centers are open now, not till 11 p.m., but till 9 p.m., and you can come in and, uh, you know, we've got programs going on, but there's also times when there's open gyms and different kinds of activities and the weight facilities are open. Uh, during the summer months, we go to our summer hours, which are daytime hours, Monday through Friday. The late night bike basketball program was one that we we did. You provided funding last year to expand that program, and we did. My my count, it looked like about 2,200 uh, participants in that program. Uh, I also agree that there needs to be some other uh, activities if we can do that. Uh, obviously, all of these uh, programs take resources, but while basketball obviously is very popular with young teen, especially male population. Um, there's a female population out there that maybe we're not reaching with that. Um, and there are a number of folks that, you know, maybe basketball isn't the uh, activity that resonates with them, that if we had other things going on in the center, um, not sure what all those are, but, you know, there's a lot of opportunities out there that you could draw more people in. So I think, you know, evening programming, late night programming is important um, and does have a positive impact. So we, we need to continue to look where we can with the resources to how to uh, provide that service. But the program as we operated in 2013 is in the budget for 2014 and will continue. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is uh, Clinton Bentley, senior. Good evening, sir. If you just could restate your name, uh, your address, any organizations you represent, you have three minutes. Thanks. Hello, my name is uh, Clinton Bentley Sr. My address is 400 Kendall Place, um, Columbus, Ohio. I'm also a part of the Community Foundations, the group that approached last year about the funding for the Midnight Basketball. First, I would like to take the time to thank members for giving an additional $20,000 to the Midnight Basketball Program this summer. We believe extending the program to more vacation centers was very, very positive. It far reached our expectations. In addition to adding recreation centers, this, excuse me, this would give kids who aren't into basketball, something else to do. Excuse me. I am committed to community foundations and would like to volunteer in any way to help out. We hope that but we will consider you increasing your investment into midnight basketball this year. And at this time, I would like to um, thank everybody for what they did and to wish all y'all happy holiday season. Happy holidays to you as well, Mr. Bentley. Thanks for coming down. Our next speaker is James Jones, Jr. Welcome back to council, sir. At this point, I think you probably know the drill of yes. name, address. You have three minutes. Uh, Good evening, everybody. My name is James Jones. My address is 1750 Rebecca Street, Columbus, Ohio, and I am a member of Community Foundations. We came to you last year with a proposal to expand late night basketball, and we appreciate City Council approving $20,000 uh, $20, for that program last year. We especially want to thank uh, you, Representative Zach Klein, and uh, 
Director Mr. Alan McKnight for giving us the opportunity to bring Midnight Basketball back to our recreation centers. This issue is important to me personally because it's all about saving children's lives by keeping them off the streets and giving them positive activities to participate in. As I mentioned last year, our goal is for our children to pick up a ball instead of a gun. Though the homicide rate is still too high, it did decrease in 2013. We believe this in part because older teenagers were giving something to do in the evenings in our recreation centers. Community foundations have worked tirelessly to make sure these teenagers are given an opportunity to have organized fun. We worked closely with Mr. James Davis, the director of the late night basketball program, to make sure that the program stayed 100% positive. With the recent bond issue passing, our recreation centers have the opportunity to become some of the best in the country. While the bond can make our recreation centers uh, beautiful facilities, on the other hand, we also need to invest in quality programming. We want city council to invest more in staff and security guards for this program, which will ensure it remains a safe place for our children to be. We also want to see the program expanded to an additional five recreation centers. The five recreation centers this past season, Dodge, Douglas, Driving Park, Woodward Park, and Marion Franklin, uh, each had successful programs this year. However, we know many young people can't travel to other neighborhoods because of transportation or safety issues, which is why we want this program to expand uh, to an additional five recreation centers this year. The five additional recreation centers we are proposing are Blackburn, Barnett, Brittanell, Milo, Grogan, and Howard. The communities surrounding Blackburn and Howard are especially in need of this program. We conducted a survey of recreation center participants by asking them where they would be most likely to participate in a late night basketball program. And these were the top five answers outside of the current locations. And uh, a dedication to my grandmother, Ms. Aura, uh, Aura Jones, who is uh, watching this program right now. I just wanna say, Aura Mom, I love you very much and thank you for watching. And once again, uh, thank you city council members. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jones. Our next speaker is Aslan Rodriguez. Welcome to council. If you just could uh, restate your name, identify any organizations you represent, your address, you have three minutes. Good evening, Councilman Klein. My name is Asleen Rodriguez. I'm the co-executive director of After School All Stars, which is 263 Carpenter Street, uh, Columbus, Ohio, 43205. Um, I want to on behalf of After School All Stars and after school programs in general, I want to thank you for the past three years of financial support that has been provided through the Department of Recreation and Parts. We are exceptionally grateful for this year's 2014 awarding of funds. Um, here in Ohio, 30% of our K-12 youth are responsible for taking care of themselves after school. And a recent report from the Department of Economics um, from the City of Columbus reported that 21% of Columbus residents live below the federal defined poverty line. At the schools that, served, um, that are served through the Recre Recreation and Parts Grant, Muller Elementary, 94% of the participants qualify for federal free or reduced um, meal plans. At Columbus Collegiate Academy West, another school that's supported by the Recreation and Parks, 100% of the per, uh, participants at that school qualify for free um, and reduced school program meals. We're not the solution, but we're definitely part of the solution. We serve over 120 students at Moeller Elementary with an average daily attendance of 88 kids that stay after school uh, in school. At Columbus Collegiate Academy West, we have 118 students enrolled and 66 students stay after school in school. We're a two to three hour program. So when school's out, we go into the schools. We provide a lot of the programming that 
principals and educators are sad to see leave their schools. So the first hour is academics. We also partner with Children's Hunger Alliance to provide a warm meal. So we talk about homework help, we talk about test prep, we do enrichment courses during that academic hour. We also partner with Highlights for Kids and each kid gets a magazine. We use that during the programming and at the end of the use of the magazine, we invite the kids to take it home to build their own library in their homes. During the enrichment hour, we partner with Local Matters, we partner with um, the Zoo, COSI, Fifth Third, First T, Fencing, Zumba, and our partners back there, Hockey for Everyone. We really want our kids to have opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have. And we don't ask the schools to fully fund us, we come as a partnership. Recreation and Parks allows us to come as a partnership to these schools because we know that their budgets don't allow for a complete comprehensive program. So we know that this is a partnership. We look for federal, state, local dollars to support what the schools are giving us in addition to private and corporate dollars. We ask that the council consider increasing their budget um, for recreation and parks to provide after school programming. That, that uh, budgetary line was cut and although we are still a recipient of it, we would love to see an increase of funds so that we are able to provide more students across Columbus with this opportunity to have um, enrichment in their lives beyond the classroom, but also supporting the classroom. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. What is what is your official request? Or have you submitted one to Reckon Parks? We did. So we submitted th uh, four um, proposals for grants. We received two of those um, for Moeller Elementary and Columbus Collegiate Academy U.S. We also submitted one for Champion Middle School, which we know is one of the lowest performing schools in Columbus, and Columbus Collegiate Academy, um, Columbus Preparatory School for Boys at $20,000 each for those schools. So we would be seeking an additional 40000 But in general, for recreation and parks, that pot of money for after school programs, and I'm speaking not just for after school, but for beyond that. So for the other the other programs that receive funding through recreation parks, we'd love to see that pot increase so that we can continue. We can't serve every kid. We know that it's collective impact. We know that our partners, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club, you know, the Urban League, they're serving students as well. We'd love to see that pot grow so that we can provide more students with this opportunity. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Larry Soniel. Soniel? Soroniel. 0 for 4, I believe. Apologies, sir. Welcome to council. Larry Sirwick. Sirwick. That's quite all right. Okay, I'm sorry. You know, I, uh, I think that uh, uh, the president of the association, Mike Watson, as well as R. Lee, and Heather have, uh, have spoken very elegantly regarding the recs and uh, 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 city recs uh, and parks hockey club. I'm really here really to speak very briefly as, a, as an outsider. Um, I'm one of those thousand lives that Mike spoke on just a few minutes ago that were touched as well as my sons. We joined uh, uh, the team just this past October and uh, it motivated me to come down to speak tonight just briefly. For the last 10 years, um, I've, uh, I've been associated with youth hockey throughout the city of Columbus with the other organizations, uh, both as a manager uh, for the Junior Jackets, as well as a, uh, um, a council member with CAHA, the other organization. And in doing so, uh, many of the friends that we have met, both myself and my son, in the past 10 years, come through the arena of hockey. But again, I'm really not here to speak about hockey simply about my observations that I'm seeing uh, with the Columbus Ice Hockey Club, with the mentoring program that is clearly affixed and in place, with complete respect uh, to Director McKnight and the budget that he has to manage and oversee. Uh, I know that there are a lot of valuable places to place this money. I can only tell you that uh, uh, from my eyes and the witness that we've seen, these kids are really, really getting a great benefit, not just with uh, the, the sport, but with the teamwork and uh, obviously all of the uh, accolades and benefits that come from that, that are going to help them through their adult life. Um, so again, thank you, Director McKnight, uh, 
the Rex and Park uh, budget for supporting the Columbus Ice Hockey Club. I encourage you to continue to do just that. If there's room for expansion, there's a tremendous uh, number of assets beginning with uh, Mike, as well as the uh, program director, John Hafferman, that are in place. Uh, the kids that are being mentored are um, continuing to, if you will, recycle and come back and give back. That's the types of things we're seeing. I do know that with the other associations I've been with, uh, we do find that um, perhaps 70% of those that get involved in coaching and mentoring do so for the wrong reasons. Many of them are selfish or that they want their kid to play more. It's just not the case here at all. This is not about a win at all costs. This is not about uh, uh, my kid. This is about making everybody better. And I'm pleased to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Servick. Our final speaker is Mr. Nathaniel George Wilkins. Welcome back to council. Sixteen twelve Arlington Avenue, Mr. Lathan George Wilkins, the chairman of Solely Vacant Abandonment Property in the North London area. I will be speaking on uh, development here. Um, I just got a couple questions here. Um, as in code enforcement, I know I want to thank uh, Nikki Brandon for all her endeavors, what she does in department development. But I want to ask a question. What is a real estate asset manager? And what that would, you know, I, I want a question to ask is what does that attain to? And how does that affect the uh, community and involvement such as uh, high weeds and cutting grass and things? Well, when, when I call 311, for a case in an emergency, okay, um, tall grass can ten to five to seven feet tall and uh, and open doors. So, um, when I call, if there's an open structure, it it doesn't speed the process that quickly. Where I had to wait in a car to call 311 to see if there's a uh, vacant structure that's open, then I will call the uh, co supervisor of Maria Bad and let her know that this house has been open by them patching me over to somebody else as the property can't get boarded up right quickly. And then I had to call the uh, police department to make sure that the uh, police department can take a walk through through the province and just don't make anybody this to be sitting in there or idolizing the vacant structure. Um, all I just would like to know what is a real estate asset manager does for the uh, community. So that's all I would like to know. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Deputy Director Brandon. Thank you, Chairman Klein. Uh, Mr. Wilkins, the real estate asset manager is assigned to our land redevelopment office. Uh, they're responsible for marketing, showing to potential um, applicants, buyers, the properties that are in the land bank. Uh, we are adding this asset manager because we have been working uh, to take nearly 400 additional properties through this expedited foreclosure uh, procedure that's been put in place. And with those additional properties coming into the land bank, we need an additional asset manager to help manage the property. They're essentially property managers that go out to ensure that once we acquire the properties, they are boarded up properly, and they also take the time to show the property to potential buyers. Thank you, Deputy Director Brandon, uh, and thank you for coming this evening to present at the development hearing. Director McKnight and his accompanying staff, thank you for the Reckon Parks uh, presentation. I also want to thank all the speakers that came this evening. Again, uh, I want to offer apologies for the delay in starting the hearing, but uh, I appreciate the input that you provided. I uh, found that uh, a lot of this uh, testimony, um, actually all the testimony, was uh, was very helpful as we um, figure out what uh, what's going to be done with the budget going forward and as council makes its amendments and uh, 
we proceed from this point through development in rec and parks in the process and it sounds like um, as we always know that there's some great programs in recreation and parks and the testimony provided uh, demonstrated that and of course the efforts that we're making we had the three hour hearing about vacant and abandoned housing about code issues about tenants about landlords and a lot of that playing in with the additional code officers and being proactive enforcement certainly will be a, a beneficial step in uh, making our neighborhoods uh, safe and strong for its residents. Uh, that concludes the hearing. Unless is there any speaker slips that I'm missing? Everyone get a chance to speak that wanted to speak. Terrific. Uh, have a wonderful holiday and a great uh, rest of the week. Uh, thank you.